Welcome, and thank you for joining Speak Up for Safer Care. This podcast is brought to you by Safer Care Texas, the Patient Safety Division at the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth, Texas, where it's our mission to challenge traditional thinking to eliminate preventable harm. Speak Up for Safer Care illuminates gaps in care, process, or design that lead to preventable harm in all healthcare settings. I'm your host, John Sims, uh, Director of Safer Care Texas, and our co-host, um, Leanne Cunningham, couldn't make it today. And so standing in her place is our newest clinical executive, Bobby Bratton. She is a family nurse practitioner. So thank you for stepping in, Bobby. Sure, sure do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. This epi- this is episode three entitled Medication Access. And our guest today is Dr. Megan Wessling. Welcome, Dr. Messling. Thank you for having me. So Dr. Megan Wessling is an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacotherapy at the Health Science Center College of Pharmacy. She's double board certified in pharmacotherapy and ambulatory care and serves as the ambulatory care pharmacy director and a clinical pharmacist in a family medicine clinic at the Health Science Center here in Fort Worth, Texas. So, wow, uh, that's that's a that's a awesome uh, background. Is there anything that you want to add to that? No, I think that wrapped it up um, pretty, pretty robustly Um, came from. Chicago, where I did my training um, for a doctor of pharmacy at Midwestern University, Chicago College of Pharmacy, um, and really enjoyed the patient care um, interactions in an outpatient setting. So I pursued two years of residency training. Um, the first was at a veterans affairs facility in the west coast or on the west side of Chicago, mm-hmm. um, and then completed my second year in ambulatory care, serving an underserved or under underinsured patient population in west and south side of Chicago. Um, And after that, I I made my way back to Texas Mm -hmm. um, to join the Family Medicine Clinic at HSC Health. That's that's great, Dr. Wessling. And um, uh, uninsured or underinsured is something that our our patients are facing right now. And our topic today is accessing medications. And so that is... uh, a, a big challenge. It is. Can you take us through kind of what a patient might go through? You know, they receive a prescription from their doctor. Um, tell us what they go through uh, from that process all the way until they have the medication in their hand. Absolutely. And and you've seen the landscape of prescribing change, right? Many people may remember getting a written prescription that is in their hand. They walk it to pharmacy Um, And the pharmacist, their local pharmacist, will fill that prescription at the counter. Mm -hmm. Um, We've seen transitions to more electronic formats of prescribing, and I think that has been great in terms of speed and accuracy of information being transcribed between the the physician and the pharmacy. However, there can be issues that occur when you're relying on technology. Um, so what I see happens is the patient will leave the, the visit. Hopefully that prescription makes it to their desired pharmacy. Um, that's part of kind of the, the process with the visit is confirming that pharmacy that the patient should be going to. Sometimes they land where we don't necessarily mm. in t- intend them to be. Maybe it wasn't a verified pharmacy. So sometimes patients hopefully will have their prescription ready for them at pickup at their preferred pharmacy. Sometimes we're we're hunting it down to see where it went. Um, and ideally, insurance is on file at pharmacy. Um, we're able to submit the prescription for reimbursement for the, um, the payment of that drug. The pharmacist verifies the details of the prescription and it has it ready for them to dispense um, at the time the patient presents. Now, within that, again, there can be some variations just because there are a lot of pieces or a lot of steps along that process that could be um, identified as a barrier just because insurance may not be approved or it's not the preferred medication on the formulary. They don't have it in stock. So there could be a lot of Um, pieces that we have to jump through um, before we finally get that to that patient. Mm, Wow. So it sounds like we we were trying to improve this process, but there were some uh, technology challenges beyond a patient's control. Correct. So 
Yeah, that's a lot different than back in the day when you would handwrite the prescription and hand it to the patient, and then they're out the door, and um, the responsibilities on them of where they want to take it, but then they had to wait longer to get the prescription. And, you know, for some with mobility challenges or the elderly, you know, it became a real problem. So being able to send it electronically definitely has its blessings because Mm -hmm. when everything goes well, they get the prescription faster and easier. Yes. So with that, though, there's a lot of different opportunities for people to, and technology to be involved. So can mm-hmm. you talk about like some of the obstacles that you've encountered? Absolutely. And I think the, the most common obstacle that I will encounter in my practice and what I see a lot of our patients encounter is um, on the side of the insurance. Um, so we, we have state-funded insurance, we have commercial insurance, we have federal insurance. So there's a lot of different payers related to prescription drug therapy, and every insurer has what we call a formulary. So essentially, it's a list of medications um, that the insurance is going to recommend covering or have preference for covering. Um, so that preference for what insurance will cover may be different than what the, the prescriber's preference is. And so I think the biggest obstacle is overcoming what that preference is. Um, and that is where we see a lot of delays in access. Um, it's a lot of communication. If insurance isn't covering a prescription, we have to get back with the physician or whoever the prescriber was. We got to figure out what's preferred. We send it back. And you see a lot of time lag or delay um, in patients accessing their medications as one of the probably most common obstacles. Mm. Other obstacles that I see um, is related to recalls or back orders of Mm. medication that maybe is not in stock. Um, at the time that the patient presents to their preferred pharmacy. And so that could also be a reason or a common reason that we see um, delay in patients being able to pick up that prescription in a reasonable time frame. Um, And there's solutions to to both scenarios, but I would say those are probably the two common obstacles um, that we try to work around. You know, that's interesting. I was just thinking when you were talking, Dr. Wessling, about uh, the different payers and the different formularies. Mm-hmm. Um, we've gone through this recently with my wife's medications, uh, and it was it was for a thyroid medication. And uh, we went back and forth with the insurance company because they wanted to know what other medications had been tried and failed. And they went back and forth to the doctor mm-hmm. and – Long story short, but they they um, they got the information, but they wound up not getting it in the same form that that they were accustomed to getting it in, and right. so therefore it didn't happen, mm. and it just caused a like a significant delay in access to to her thyroid medication. Absolutely, yeah, and so um, I, I just think about you know, the pandemic and our healthcare worker shortage that we're dealing with now. You think about a a physician who's got many more patients with less staff to work with, Mm -hmm. and they're having to go back and forth and write these these, uh, justifications, right, as to why this patient needs that medication. Absolutely, yes. So with that in mind, it's not all about me, (laughs) (laughs) but can you you describe, you know, what kind of harm – comes from from what we're dealing with right now. You said there's some solutions, but um, and we, I, I'd love for you to go over some of those uh, potential solutions, but what harm are our patients subjected to with this system? Yeah, I think that, you know, the most, the one that probably comes to mind um, the quickest is the actual management of that condition, right? So in the example of thyroid, maybe we had a patient who had a really well-controlled thyroid hormone on the current treatment um, that was prescribed that we adjusted based on the patient's labs. And um, delaying that can quickly reverse that control. Mm -hmm. Um, It could bring additional costs to the patient to regain control. Um, And you see that in a lot of different chronic conditions or infections. Um, Another example is related to infections or exacerbations that we see. Um, trying to get an uh, antibiotic approved for the patient to treat a urinary tract infection. Mm. I've seen scenarios, unfortunately, where 
we've had delay in accessing a common medication used in the treatment of urinary tract infection, but because of the delay in receiving that, the infection had progressed, resulting in hospitalization and additional costs, IV medication use that then the patient and the health system had to incur. So I think directly related to clinical outcomes is where we have the biggest concern for harm when it comes to delay in medication access. Dr. Wessling, um, that is a great answer. It's an unfortunate answer, but it is the reality that we live in. It uh, is. You think of somebody that has a simple urinary tract infection, and you might order an antibiotic, um, and they're over it in three, four, five days. Mm -hmm. Of course, they continue taking their antibiotics, right, even when their symptoms resolve. All the way to the end. That's right. <laughs> of course that's, they do. <laughs> that's right. But if there's a delay, like you said, they can progress, especially in the elderly, all the way to sepsis mm -hmm. with a very expensive hospital stay, possibly ICU, you know. And right now, our ICUs are packed. Correct. So it behooves us uh, to resolve this issue. Absolutely. Um, Go ahead. Bobby. Well, I'd like to interject that with that scenario, um, I think sometimes part of the delay may come from the patient knowing that they need these medicines and, and that they're part of that communication of closing the loop mm -hmm. on that I'm not getting them. You know, this needs to be done. This communication needs to be sent. But, but sometimes their lack of education that with a urinary tract infection, they may also think, well, it's just a urinary tract infection. So, you know, if I'm delayed a few days on my medicine, is it going to be a big deal? Right. But sometimes it is a big deal. Or even with the thyroid medicine, thinking, oh, but it's such a teeny tiny dosage. So, you know, if I go a few days without that, then maybe that's not going to be a big deal. Not realizing that sometimes... Um, the parameters of what you're trying to achieve and how long it takes to, to get you, get the patient where they need to be, mm -hmm. that that one or two days of delay can, can make a big difference. Big difference. Education Absolutely. opportunity. Yeah. Yes, and that's part of, um, I think, up front, especially when chronic conditions like thyroid or other diabetes, for example, are diagnosed, um, an opportunity for that very detailed education up front allows them to be more informed um, and more attuned to how they manage and what some of those delays could result in um, related to their health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Dr. Wessling, I, um, I cannot remember the source, but I was looking at some data on um, outcomes mm -hmm. in the state of Texas. And one that jumped out at me, there were several, where Texas was number 50 in the nation. Uh, on people avoiding care due to cost, mm -hmm. okay? And I know that that's a barrier when it comes to medications. Absolutely. Um, I, the medic, oh, wow, they're just extremely expensive, even if you have insurance. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned we have some solutions. Um, it, it sounds like one of them is definitely communication. Yes. Right? So can you can you take us through some of what some of those solutions may be for price, you know, the cost of medications and how we can communicate more efficiently so that our patients don't go through this? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I would say starting out back at the example of the insurance and the formularies, um, one on the patients and we always, the communication loop doesn't always get closed. So I try to describe to the patient if there is an issue in accessing within the next day or two, they say that they're not able to get something approved or you don't receive the medication, I want you to give me a call as soon as possible. Um, on the other part is the understanding that formularies for many of our um, insurers are posted on the, on, you can Google them and you can find that specific insurer's formulary and what drugs are going to be covered or preferred for coverage um, and receive reasonable payment um, and hopefully eliminate or limit the co-pays that the patient may be experiencing from a cost side. And so the one thing that I harp on or I like to educate my uh, residents and physicians and other providers is how accessible those formularies are and how valuable they are, not only to the work that they're doing, but also to the care that we're providing to the patient so that that medication access process is as seamless as possible. And so we do a lot of education on what you can find in, find in the formularies, 
what the tiered system means. So there's a tiered system that describes preferred medications, which are usually more cost effective, um, more cost friendly to the patient, to those that maybe are higher on the tier that are um, more specialty, specialty care may call the cost the patient a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So I think education on the physician, the prescriber side, and accessing those formularies early on um, helps us to address those medication access issues pretty quickly. Um, but to your point, insurance, despite it being on the formula, it could still be very costly to the patient. And I think of my patients who have diabetes who are on insulin. Mm-hmm. Um, and insulin is notoriously expensive. Um, so there's a couple of solutions that I try to guide my patients through on branded drugs. Um, and if they have commercial insurance, most of the manufacturers of these branded drugs have savings coupons on their websites that patients can enroll in. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they'll be they'll bring the cost down to $10 a month, $25 a month, which may be a little bit more feasible than the $250 price tag that they walk away. Exactly. Um, the other is, you know, dependent on who the prov- who the insurer is, there are some programs um, that we can take advantage of from the state side or Medicare. Um, And I'll use insulin as my example again. Um, So presently, the state of Texas has is the 19th state, I'm very excited about it, that Mm. has put a cap on the cost of insulin, given how (laughs) life-saving it is. Um, So it's helping patients to afford these life-saving medications um, on a month-to-month basis. Instead of it being $100, $200 a month, um, we should be able to get it for $25. And CMS or Medicare has a similar program in place for Medicare uh, patients to pay no more than $35 a month for insulin. So we're seeing some changes um, and may be able to optimize some of those programs that are either offered from the manufacturer, the state, or the federal um, payers. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about, I'm I'm glad to hear that as well, because thinking about like a type 1 diabetic, insulin is almost like water to them, right? It's literally keeping them alive. And to to have to spend so much, especially with somebody that's on a fixed income, it's almost it's cruel. It is, and it's and it's life saving. It's what they have to have to to maintain, um, mm-hmm. keep them from severe complications from uncontrolled sugars. And like I said, that's just one example. Other things that we can use to help with costs um, is through patient assistant programs um, for branded drugs. Most of our manufacturers will have such um, programs that help with the cost of medications. There are some eligibility criteria that the patient has to meet, but given that they meet those criteria, the, the manufacturer will offer the medication at no cost to the patient. Um, and then there are some other uh, coupon saving programs like GoodRx mm, very familiar. Um, that will help guide the patient to maybe a pharmacy that has yes. a drug at a more reasonable cost that they're able to afford. And so you can do a little bit of shopping to find a pharmacy that may fit within your price range for the medication you're looking to, um, to start taking. How um, – how- I don't want to call it labor intensive, but if I'm a patient Mm -hmm. and I'm taking a medication that is extremely expensive and I want to go to the manufacturer, how well... how much paperwork and all that do I need to fill out to be approved? <laughs> that That is a great question. And, and to your point, there is paperwork. Uh-huh. Um, so <laughs> if, if there is something that you're looking into as a patient for um, a patient assistance program, you will be able to download an application. And, and they do make it very easy that they'll have a patient section and then they'll have a provider section. Um, and the patient is more than welcome to fill out their portion and get that application to the manufacturer. They usually provide the, ma- the address to mail it to or fax it to them. Um, and then communicate with your prescriber and say, you know, this medication is costing X dollars. I meet criteria by getting this med medication from the manufacturer would you be willing to fill out this prescriber portion of the application? And it's it's very similar to writing a prescription. Mm-hmm. So the prescriber is able to kind of put the details of the prescription down, provide refills, and similarly f- fax it to the manufacturer. And they usually will take care of the rest and communicate the next steps with the patient. Mm. 
That's that's good to hear. That's good yes. to hear. Well, Dr. Wesley, wouldn't it be wonderful if providers were trained that right after they check for the contraindications on that medicine before they prescribed it, that they're looking at the preference list to make mm. sure that they're they're at least attempting to choose a medication that that they're comfortable with prescribing and that also is preferred and you know just how that saves that saves work down the road Absolutely. for the whole clinic mm-hmm. avoiding all of the extra paperwork that would be the ideal and i think we're making progress there so you're seeing um kind of the it side mm-hmm. of um the electronic medical records, trying to integrate some of these formularies into their medication modules or their um, drug lists so that it can give the, the prescriber a little bit of an insight as, as to whether it's a preferred drug. It's going to require a prior authorization. Um, there may be additional steps needed. And so I think we're, we're slowly working our way there. Um, and there has been some breaks as well in identifying patients who are going to get prescriptions that do have prior authorizations. We have kind of a single repository or single software that we can use now for most of the insurers to submit the prior authorization very quickly um, and get an approval quite quickly as well, or response to that that request. Um, and we, in clinic, we're using Cover My Meds to help do that. That's awesome. Um, and we, as soon as I send a prescription, I'll fill out the cover my meds, and then pharmacy won't even know that there was ever a delay wow. um, in That's the authorization. Great. So how would you suggest healthcare professionals educate patients on their medications, their safety, their use, side effects? Where could we do better? I think that we have a very big ch- task in that respect, um, and I see it very regularly in clinic for the physicians that work with our patients and and the requests that our physicians or other prescribers have from the patients, that sometimes education isn't necessarily, there's not always time for that. Um, But I think the most important aspects that I would take or, or make recommendation for is ensuring that the patients understand kind of the duration of use. Um, to ensure that if it's short course or long term, they understand or have some expectations. Um, Because I do recognize that some patients will say, well, there weren't any more refills. And so I thought that was the end of the course. And so I think kind of setting that up up front with the patient will help ensure that medication adherence process or that communication loop so that patients call and say, I know this is supposed to be long term. I don't have any refills. What are the next steps? the other is, you know, if there's ways or, or areas that they've seen with patients have issues with side effects, letting the patients know up front what those side effects may be and also provide ways that they may be able to reduce the risk of side effects. Um, and I think that, again, will speak to medication adherence um, for that disease state or for that condition that we're trying to treat um, and, again, set up expectations um, that the patient will have at home. Um, and I will, as a pharmacist, I will endorse the use of your pharmacist, whether in the clinic or in the community, um, and communicate with them and, and also encourage the patients to be talking to their local pharmacist. Um, they're very accessible. They're able to answer those questions if there's questions that the patient has. Um, and so that there's some accountability between both sides, the, the prescriber side and the pharmacy side for the success of that patient and their medication use. Absolutely. You know, you go to the pharmacy to pick up your prescription and they always ask, would you like to speak with the pharmacist? Take advantage of that. Even Absolutely. if even if you felt like you left the office with a good education on your medications, like take the opportunity to get the repetition. It's only going to make you understand and remember more. Mm -hmm. And if there's concerns with, you know, I get a lot of questions from our patients. You get this huge, you know, patient information list in your bag that you pick up from pharmacy. Um, And I I get a lot of questions from patients because there are concerns. They they list the common side effects. They list the severe or rare side effects. Um, And if there's questions, the pharmacist in your local community is certainly equipped to be able to answer that for you or provide you some insight and some perspective so that you can make an informed decision on using the medication or if there needs to be a further conversation with the prescriber to change something if there's 
something you're worried about um, on the side of the side effect profile for the medication prescribed. Mm, good information. You know, Dr. Wessling, it sounds to me like you are patient-centered and you're definitely a patient advocate. Absolutely. And that that is, uh, I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, kind of a side note, but because of the pandemic, the pandemic has made a lot of our healthcare professionals, it's not that they don't care, it's just they're, they don't have anything left because of the sheer volume. Mm-hmm. And so it's great to hear that um, that you are really you are really out there to serve our patients. That's awesome. And I think that you know I think getting names out and and using all of the healthcare professionals in the system to support the patients, our nurse practitioners, our yes. physician assistants, our social workers. Um, there's all a skill set that is available to serve the patient and meet the needs of that patient. And I'm just on the medication side. Um, but I think that everyone has an opportunity. And if there's somebody that you can, that the patient may benefit from talking to or seeing that there's a concern um, that may not be addressed or they can't get access to their physician, there's other people that hopefully we can help support that patient and, and lean on um, to answer their questions or concerns. I would respectfully argue that you're also on the advocacy side, not just the medication side. I, I am. I try. I try. I have a very, um, I support the patients. I want to make sure that they're successful in the goals that they have for themselves and their health. And I also feel that there's a lot that the healthcare system can do um, and lean on each other to help support the patient because it is a very tasking job. Sure. So what inspired you to become a pharmacist? So I was very lucky as a high schooler to meet a pharmaceutical science, scientist um, when I was in high school. And I really in, I knew my strengths in the area of chemistry. I, I really enjoyed serving others. And I tried to find the outlet that would allow me to do that, um, that met those strengths. And my, my aunt was an, a nurse. I had my pharmaceutical scientist teacher, um, and I started investigating pharmacy, and I f- fell in love with the option of being able to really make a difference in the success of patients with respect to their health care on the side of safe and effective medication use. And so I graduated high school and kind of went from there um, and found myself in ambulatory care. Um, where I'm able to work with the patients face-to-face, see what's working for their medications, what's not, what are barriers um, to their care, their access, um, and problem solve. I think that's the thing I get excited about the most is being able to find solutions to problems that patients may face and help them get a little bit closer to meeting their goals. Well, that is awesome, and it sounds like... uh Every patient uh, that you come across is very fortunate to have you on their team. I, I hope that I help serve them um, <laughs> and make their, their life a, a scooch better. Well, thank you, Dr. Wessling, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. And thank you, audience, for listening. Speak Up for Safer Care is made for the healthcare community by Safer, Safer Care Texas, which is the patient safety division at the University of North Texas Health Science Center here in Fort Worth. We'd like to thank our technical producer, Rob Upchurch. And remember, you should speak up, advocate for yourself, your family, and your colleagues. If you are a healthcare worker, a counselor, a subject matter expert, former patient, or caregiver, and you have a patient safety story to tell, remember to be HIPAA compliant, but share that story with Safer Care Texas. We want to hear from you, and you may be our next guest. Please contact us through our website, safercaretexas.org. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Tune in next week as Dr. Teresa Wagner, a Safer Care Texas clinical executive and health literacy expert, defines health literacy and its influence on patient safety. Thank you again for listening, and as always, speak up for safer care.